very much. Did you get the answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, please, please. Yeah. Spitz, Fred, I understand that it was your idea with regard to Nicaragua. I just appreciate this opportunity very briefly to thank you all for what you're doing and what you have done, and particularly with regard to our situation there in Nicaragua. And the other day, uh, I, thanks to Dave Fisher, I got to see some of the commercials that you have put on. I can tell you I enjoyed it more than a rerun of Bedtime for Bonzo. <laughs> <laughs> What you have accomplished, and it is so important and so vital, and getting more so. The information continues to come in. There is no question about the total totalitarian uh, type of government that has come into being in Nicaragua. And we just cannot stand by and let another Soviet directed nation and satellite be implanted, particularly on the mainland of the Americas. And what you've done is, believe me, of the greatest of help. There's been a great disinformation campaign that has made many of our very well-meaning people who still aren't aware of the problem in Nicaragua and how important it is that we, we do what is being done there. But I've been told that, because I only have a few minutes here, that before I leave, I can go over here a ways and stop and that maybe all of you can come by and we can uh, meet individually and at the same time have a picture taken of each one of us together. And uh, I always take mine off too. <laughs> Since you were asking, maybe just one or two, and then I know my time is limited, but one or two questions that uh, I might take a crack at. If not, I'll turn them over to you. <laughs> Someone have a question? That, uh, Mr. President, we were just discussing uh, how to get this country organized. <laughs> to back you and your effort, and this country's effort, to handle the Sandinista problem. Uh, I admit that I pointed to that fellow over there. I said I didn't like him too much, but he showed that what he wanted out of the people. And uh, Mr. President, I think the, the American people, if they're hit directly and shocked a bit as to what's going on, given the truth, we hope they will react and force their congressman to approve military aid, sir. I can't, can't agree more. I think that the biggest problem that we have is that, very frankly, even with all of the media that we have now, maybe because of it, uh, <laughs> great lack of information on the part of the people of some of the things that are going on. And if there's anything I get frustrated about, it's I go out and I make a speech, and then I look at the evening news, and there I am, and I see my mouth going, so I know I'm talking, but the voiceover is telling the people what they think and say. And then the subject that was of greatest moment for it, perhaps something of this on this very subject, in that speech, that never gets mentioned. So all the people really know is that I made a speech in South Succotash or wherever I was at the time, but nobody knows what I said, unless, except the people that were there. And this is why what you're doing and the very fact that you've been using the media is so, so tremendously important. It is a case of what well, we discovered in movies some years ago, that with all of our billboards and all of our uh, teasers that were put on the end of the picture as to what was going to be seen next week and so forth, that the greatest advertising that the motion picture industry had was word of mouth. The people that said to their neighbors, hey, did you see the picture last night? Mm -hmm. Well, I found that a lot of that word of mouth is just what you are doing and can do. Uh, I'm, I'm always surprised to sometimes with luncheons of groups in here on some various subjects and over in the state dining room and sitting at our table start talking about something that to us is, well, like budgeting, just recently, and top business executives sitting around the table, they had no idea of what is the budget process of the federal government or any idea that that process 
is just about the most Mickey Mouse thing that has ever been put in place. There isn't a state in the union that would put up with it. Every state has got a better budgeting process than the federal government. But I was amazed that all of them were totally surprised at just a few sentences about that. They had no idea of what the process was. So what you are doing is great. And I agree that you can. that's why I've got that five minutes on Saturday. And at least that does get a play in the national news after I've said we're going to say and we try to use that, but his secret was going direct to the people. Had Having had a career in radio as a sports announcer some years ago, and back when that was going on, you might be interested to know that he had the highest audience rating of any program that was ever on radio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, I want to tell you that we put together here all private citizens our budget is $2 million to support you in eight weeks, a little over $200,000 a week. It is the largest amount ever put together by a private group in support of a president on one issue. And the one man who has sensitized us and brought us together more than any other person in the past year to help you is the man who's given us these public briefings uh, on top of everything else in his work is Colonel Oliver North. And I want to thank him very much. He's responsible for all this problem. <laughs> What you have accomplished and it's just magnificent. And, uh, believe me, here is an example that in spite of all of the efforts of the bureaucracy, we still do have government by the people. Mm -hmm. you can, you can do. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, would it be uh, offensive to you if those of us of this group would uh, organize and try to motivate and suggest a nationwide outcry and, and uh, asking for, that we face up to this problem as good Americans? And probably started by you, because you could tell the people and they'll listen to you. And we believe that the people of the country want to know what you say, and they get irritated when the media starts telling them what you said. <laughs> well, we are discussing right now, uh, going to the TV screen, uh, right now, a couple of things imminent on our plate, like <coughs> the budget and the tax reform and so forth, but these others, one of great importance that we should take to the people, and that is, again, the uh, absolutely distorted view that a drumbeat of propaganda has given the people with regard to our defense spending and the defense budget. Our defense budget is a, roughly a fourth, maybe a percentage or two uh, percent, uh, above that uh, point about that, but traditionally, going back over the past, uh, defense, national security being the prime function of the federal government has normally been half of the federal budget. So we're down to this, we're down to a lower figure as a percentage of gross national product. And we didn't buy a $400 hammer. Uh, we bought about 20,000 hammers from six to eight dollars a piece. And then some fellow in the Navy found an invoice, and including the invoice was a single hammer at $435. The people got the invoice back, and uh, we got the $435 back. So, uh, and there are several other things of that kind. And right today, there has been, I think, one of the most effective buildups and improvements in our military. We've had draft, as you know, when everyone was subject to the draft. Uh, and yet today, we boast the highest percentage of high school graduates in the military that we have ever had in the nation's history. And in the three intelligence brackets that we use for classifying what jobs military should do, we have the highest percentage we've ever had in the top the intelligence bracket. And it's when we came here, on any given day, half the airplanes in our military service could not be flown for lack of spare parts or fuel or even pilots. Half of our Navy vessels couldn't leave port for want of full crew or spare parts. All of this has been corrected. And if there's one thing I'm more proud of than anything, it's those young men and women of ours in uniform. They are just so tremendous. You know, I'd go out and get in the helicopter and that Marine's throwing the salute. <laughs> <laughs> I was an officer in the war. I know that when you're not 
not in uniform, you don't salute, and so I would nod and uh, no, sir, they'd still stand there. <laughs> One night over at the Marine headquarters, I said to the commanding general, I said, I know I'm not in uniform, but I am the commander in chief. There ought to be a regulation that would permit me to return the salute of those men. I learned something about the job that night. He said, I think if you did it, no one would say anything. <laughs> so I now throw a highball back. <laughs> to see that face break in. <laughs> well, I think we'd better line up here for what we're going to do. Maybe. <laughs> Okay, well.